it's the second season of the Magical Mommy Monday podcast. Jen and Angela are two moms raised on Disney magic, figuring out parenthood one day, one milestone, and sometimes one meltdown at a time. Thanks for listening and enjoy this week's new episode. Welcome to the Magical Mommy Monday podcast. I am Jen and I am missing a co-host, Angela. Unfortunately, she is under the weather today, but I brought in a co-host. A it's it's kind of like when Regis would be out and Kathy Lee or Kelly had to find someone and they go to Anderson and you know whoever else. So I went to my other podcast, Theme Park Thursday, to bring on my co-host, also my brother, Frank. Frank, say hello. I feel magical. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yes. You are not a magical mommy, but you're a magical dad. I'm magical. You're I'm just magical, generally right? magical in right, general, yeah. and I think it's applicable here. Yeah, sure. Exactly. But happy to fill in for our long lost Dillo sibling, Angela. Yes, yes. We call her our long lost sibling, even though so far DNA has not proved that, but maybe one day. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> yes. And we have a very special guest today who is. A fellow Long Islander, but not currently. But we, we've we were talking a bit beforehand, so it's good to have some familiarity. I can't say that word. You said it, you it said right. It better you, in my head. It's because we talk fast. You said it's slow, but it's yeah, still correct. Exactly. I have to sound it out. <laughs> yeah. But Stacy Peasley is here. Stacy, welcome to the Magical Mommy Monday podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love excited. it. No one can see this, but Stacy has an amazing penguin background, and I'm loving it. And it makes me think we should have brought out our green screens and set something up, and we have failed you. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I, you know, I figured in the basement away from my kids making noise is probably my best location. So yes. Here with a good <laughs> microphone also. There you go. That always helps. I know. We, we tend to record any kind of podcast at night for that reason, like... Mm -hmm. Usually it's bedtime. If not, it's getting close to it. We kind of go into a secure location. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Jen's kids go to sleep much earlier than mine. So I'm playing yeah. the muting, unmuting game right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, Stacey, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited to talk about everything because um, 28 years that you've been doing what you do, which is a lot to cover, so we'll see how much we can get in. But can you tell us a little bit about your musical background? Sure, sure. So let's see, should I start with the present and go and rewind? <laughs> However so right you'd now, like. <laughs> I am currently a singer, songwriter, performer, and early childhood music specialist for kids and families, usually ages six and under, um, in the Boston area. And I, in, in non-COVID times, I would be performing at concerts, visiting schools, libraries, daycare centers, running Mommy and Me music classes, and sometimes birthday parties. So it's a, have been a very busy career doing that for about 10 years. And then prior to that, I was in a lot of adult top 40, which I know on Long Island was a big deal. I had <laughs> a lot of those Long Island top 40 bands. Nice. Okay, he's a lot of yeah. Them. Oh, yeah. Woo. <laughs> um, the Dublin Pub, all those. Yeah. Is that, is that still there? Uh, no. It's not. Uh, I know. <laughs> so many great, and Huntington, of course, so many great mm -hmm. venues. So I did a lot of the club scene and stuff like that on Long Island and, um, Park and Recs, um, weddings, you know, ran the gamut of like top 40-ish type of <laughs> bands since I was like 18, starting at 18. Okay, that's pretty awesome. And one of the bands you were, you were in is the Chicklets. Yes. <laughs> was that one of the first? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And was that one of your first bands that you were in? Yes, that was yeah. the first band that was not like a high school band. Okay. You know, I, I yeah. definitely, it's funny, I didn't even go back to high school. I kind of started, ended off when I was 18. But before I was 18, <laughs> you know, when I was in high school, I was kind of like the girl singer in the bands with all the guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. You know, yeah. rehearsing, a you know, typical like rehearsing in garages. Yeah. And um, playing school events. And the Chicklets was definitely the first band that I ever auditioned for as as a grown up. 
<laughs> I remember I lied. I was 18, but I told them I was 19. I don't know. Sure. Why. Hey, know that extra so year, so I mean, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and I got in, and it was great because it was, funnily enough, it was a tribute band to 50s and 60s girl groups. Okay. So I entered the band with two other girls who were also brand new. So there were three of us as singers and front people, and then obviously we had a band of musicians behind us. So I, I've always been singing with other female singers in a lot of my bands throughout the years, which has been really, really awesome, and I've learned so much from them. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. Can we uh, just talk about music tastes as the Long Islander growing up? Because <laughs> I feel like a lot of Long Islanders are more in, you know, the top 40, but it's, I feel like there's also a wider net of what Long Islanders like in terms of music. Do you think that's what drew you to kind of like singing in the bands that play different decades? It's because, you know, it wasn't just like Guns N' Roses. I'm just, yeah. I'm, but, you know, there's some people that were metal people, but I feel like yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of Long Islanders that were like, I like Billy Joel and I like Guns N' Roses. I'm mostly Whoa. talking about myself here. I like <laughs> soundtracks, you know. <laughs> I mean, and I don't know about you guys, but like, definitely, I I loved all those hair bands. I mean, I I was I'm an '80s girl, no yeah. question. Although I didn't realize, I didn't know it at the time. You know, I remember thinking like the music prior to the '70s was so awesome and so classic. And gosh, mm -hmm. is this '80s music like? Is it gonna is it gonna have longevity? Yeah. And it now that I'm on this side of it, you know, looking back, it totally does. I mean, I obviously Debbie Gibson, mm -hmm, so of I course. Her. I mean, when I was 16, <laughs> she was like it. Yeah, she was a Long Island girl in her in her house in Merrick, who was yeah. her own records, you know. <laughs> so I would love her, Tiffany, and then also all the hair bands, no question. Mm -hmm. And then also, I I, don't, I would love to know your opinion on this, although I feel like it's probably older than you guys, but <laughs> there was a pretty big like club music scene, like Stevie B, Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam. Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember? Like, is that like familiar? Yeah, and it, it, it would vary of like what you would end up seeing on MTV versus what you would see on VH1. So sometimes you would see like Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam on VH1, and you'd be like, what's happening here? Yeah, there was like a big <laughs> dance and it wasn't like electronic dance at that point it right. was and it wasn't like disco i don't even know what i'd have to look back and think like um what what they actually would refer to that type of music as now yeah um and it wasn't really rap yet you know it was, like, right. it was funny but i can i mean i loved all those you know expose yeah I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. know that mm -hmm. like, yeah, mm -hmm. all those old really um danceable bands who weren't by any means like superstars yeah they were not madonna they were not mm -hmm. houston they were not prince yeah but they i loved love that music also yeah yeah and i don't know if you'd even call them one hit wonders it would be almost like you know what would that constant top 40 radio play yeah mm -hmm. and that's what you would hear if you went to these clubs um that that's what you would hear that music yeah you know house music all night long Do you yeah <laughs> Like, who sang that song? <laughs> all night long. Say what? You know, I mean, it's like I loved all kinds of all kinds of music. No question. Yeah. 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 I think that's definitely part. I don't know. I, I agree, though, that it's definitely like a Long Island thing where you can kind of dip your toe into many different varieties. And then if we think about like when we grew up and being in the car with our parents driving around Long Island, which always felt like it took three hours to get anywhere and it could have been like 20 minutes. Um, and we think about like the songs that were playing at that point. And it was, even that was a variety Absolutely. of yeah. songs. Probably at that point, they were songs more from seventies, maybe early eighties or so, but yeah. um yeah, it, it it really did kind of cover the gamut a little bit. Do you guys yeah. did you listen to one hundred three point five? Is that oh yeah, KTU? Do you remember it that? was. Oh, yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's. I think it's still considered that. I don't know. I mean, maybe not. I feel like sometimes I go and put on the radio and I go, should I be listening to this? <laughs> Am I still okay to be listening? <laughs> exactly. Like as soon as they're not in the car and I do a Target run, I'm like, oh, KTU. What are you guys yeah. playing now? Oh, I don't know this song. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's, you know, as much as these streaming services are and YouTube are just crushing the industry, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be able to hop on Spotify yeah. and find some of these songs. Yeah. That, you know, you can't even li like, 
I mean, I got a record player for my birthday last year for my mm-hmm. husband, which was awesome. Um, but like everything you would have up until this point is either on a record or a cassette tape yep. of that era. Yeah. And and they're unplayable. You can't play them anymore. You know, so to either yeah. be able to download them or stream them if you really want to walk down memory lane. But I was a big like Sirius XM 80s on 8. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah. I, I listened to that a lot. And yeah. some of the songs they played, I'll tell you, they just brought you right back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 This is so awesome. <laughs> so you have all these bands you're playing in and you are big into this type of music. Where did the transition to more kids music happen? Oh, definitely as a mom. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and it's funny because I, I, there are some, I always remember loving records as a kid. Mm-hmm. It's funny, my mom still kept my, a lot of my 45 records from when I was young, and I have them. Yeah. Um, and it's like Good Ship Lollipop and, and just some of these really old songs. And I always loved music, and I really always remember loving probably the Annie soundtrack, the mm-hmm. 80s movie Annie soundtrack the yeah. most. And, you know, a lot of, I kind of missed, I feel like the, like I remember hearing in gym class some of the Free to Be, You and Me, that's such a big, mm-hmm. iconic album and Raffi, but I have to say, I kind of personally did not grow up on that. I don't know if, you know, it just, I kind of missed the time period because mm-hmm. I know those are such, you know, he's a, such an amazing big artist and, yeah. and I kind of felt like maybe I grew up a little later and loved Annie, um, for sure that I can just remember being my number one and the Wizard of Oz, of course. I remember having mm-hmm. an album. I st- and I do have that album. My mom did save that. That's, <laughs> nice. That's a good one. A Wizard of Oz, the story and the songs and mm-hmm. the music. Um, so I never had any really, not to say interest in kids' music, but any connection to it. By any mm-hmm. means. And then I had my own children. And when I had my first daughter, I was still gigging in some of these late night club bands and Mm -hmm. bar bands so then like getting home at like 2 a.m and then waking up at 6 a.m with a newborn or an infant yeah was not ideal yeah so I kind of I left the bands you know that I was were in which was totally Mm -hmm. fine and then started just writing just singing some kids songs and just singing a lot around the house and Mm -hmm. thought oh maybe I'll record these which I never even done before as an adult artist I don't have I have original demos that I made with like friends musicians Mm -hmm. but nothing I ever tried to I never tried to make it in New York City or anything as like an adult artist I was happy like just doing my cover band thing and just writing my own songs with fellow musicians so then when I wrote some kids songs and I wanted to record it I had no idea how expensive it was Mm -hmm. and I was like okay maybe I could gig again but instead of the adult music maybe I could do like a birthday party and I didn't even play guitar Mm -hmm. at this point so I hired a guitar player Mm -hmm. to come with me to all my gigs and learn set of the kids music that I thought I should learn like (laughs) Wheels on the Bus and things like that and of course same thing started playing out for family and friends Mm mm-hmm and and then my husband was like, why don't you learn guitar? Because this is crazy that you're paying a guitar player and you have yeah. to call him every time you book a gig to find out if he's available. Right. So I did learn guitar, um, just the basics. I'm not very, I always say I'm a singer who happens to play a little guitar. And by <laughs> no means a guitar player. <laughs> so then I started playing on my own. And then it was like, oh, this birthday party led to another one. And then that led to, hey, my, my son's preschool doesn't have a music teacher. Do you want to mm-hmm. join? And, and then it was like this ball just kept rolling and rolling. Yeah. And I just kept going with it, which is definitely my personality. <laughs> <laughs> just like, whatever, let's do yeah. it, you know. And... So it became like writing and recording music, playing birthday parties, then playing at schools. And then I took a demo music class with a friend of mine when my kids were little and we both kind of hated it. And my friend looked at me and was like, I would rather pay you to do this. So I was like, OK, light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> I, dan- I created I, I did a franchise music program originally and then I created my own program. So it all just kind of like fed off each other and word of mouth. Yeah. And to sort of put those two things together, being a teacher by day and Mm -hmm. singing at night and then making them sort of this one connected career just was completely unexpected and completely awesome. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, too, that you are a teacher. You went to school for education. So, I mean, that helps with the background, especially with writing music and, you know, 
being a mom, combining the two, um, what made you want to go into education when you were in um, school? I, lo- I just loved, you know, it's so funny. It's cute because my eight-year-old daughter right now, she's all about, I think every child, I could be wrong, but I kind of feel like every child at some point wants to mm-hmm. be a teacher. Yeah. Because that's what mm-hmm. they know. You know, they're yep. spending their days in school and they look up to their teachers and, um, and that's the phase my youngest daughter is in right now. She wants to be a teacher, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I love, originally I have to say, I love history and government and politics. Mm-hmm. We won't talk about any of that. <laughs> and um, so I originally, I thought I'd be a lawyer. Honestly, I, I, that's really was my, like I was in the law club in high school. Okay. I, Long Island had these great like mock trials. I was on the mock trial team. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought, that's what I would do, but then it just all came back to history and teaching. So mm-hmm. that's what I ended up going for. But I bounced around a little bit. I started off at Hofstra. Okay. And then I did a year at Nassau Community. Okay. While I was trying to find myself mm-hmm. making all these types of decisions. What yeah. really do I want to do? <laughs> I also I found myself there. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, liked, I mean, I was only there a year, but I have to say I mm-hmm. really liked it. <laughs> and then I ended up at Adelphi. Okay. Once I was like, all right, I'm going to be a history major and I'm going to focus on education. And I think yeah. singing singing kind of really also didn't help me zone in because I was kind of like, maybe I'll just be a singer. You know, I'll be a singer. I don't yeah. know. I, I was just very like, I guess a little confused. <laughs> um, and then just always, it always came back to teaching in my mm-hmm. heart and just loving history. So it became, I worked at um, Seaford Middle School. Oh, okay. For Long Island for yeah. about five years. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I also been I I started at Adelphi for about a few months. Like, don't think I I didn't make it through the first semester, and then I transferred to Post. Now it's LIU Post. Oh, it was yeah. CD, CW Post back yeah. then, but <laughs> and then Frank was at like Farmingdale, Nassau Community, and then you know. So I think you have to bounce <laughs> around to really to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Your story kind of reminds me, I know that you collaborated with Ben Rudnick on a song. Yes. And his story and your story kind of sound similar where once he became a dad, he started playing uh, at his kids' birthdays and they were like, you should do this. And yes. 25 Maybe years later. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. I just watched his, um, he had a, I don't know. Oh, gosh. Was it a 25th anniversary? Yes. With his band. Mm -hmm. We had him on right before that. So we got to talk to him. It was so so good. I watched it. It was like cooking brunch and watching (laughs) it live on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. He was one. It's funny because I feel like I probably used to take him, take my kids to see him. Mm -hmm. Maybe even before I did this. Yeah. Yeah. Myself. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. He was so, oh, my goodness. He was great. And another New Yorker. (laughs) <laughs> to start, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it all starts awesome. here. He's such a great guy. Yeah, he was really, he was and awesome band, to talk the to. The musicians in his band are just. Phenomenal. Yeah, and he has, and he's developed so many relationships to help with so many of his other songs that it's, it's so cool. So you have a new album coming out, yeah. so exciting, I'm called Make excited. It Happen on February 12th, right? Yep. Okay, February 12th. Can you tell us about what went into making this album and your process for it and sure, oh, sure. all the so, good stuff? My last album was released in 2016. Okay. And then, you know, the album, it, I, so back talking about back then when things were expensive, <laughs> it has not changed. <laughs> right. But what has changed is people don't buy music anymore. So now yeah. you're like, okay, I'm going to make this album and put all this money into it in time. And, and I mean, it just shows you how much artists love what they do. Yeah. That we continue to do this. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and after every album, I'm like, okay, can I do this? Should I do this? Is anybody <laughs> out there listening? You know, mm-hmm. and it's just, it's this, the creative process. It just, it's, you, you can't, you can't keep it under control. You can't yeah. suppress it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I released that last album and then I just started writing songs very casually. I def I don't ever really leave one album. Like I, I read about you know, fam- more famous artists and how, you know, like, even I just read, it's funny, I just finished Stevie Nicks's autobiography. Not Sorry, it's not an autobiography, it's a biography. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like they finish one album and it is, you tour and it is just right, you know, focusing on right making the next one. And I always find that interesting. I, you know, I definitely didn't 
I sort of don't approach it that way. I kind of just wait to see what songs come to me and what mm -hmm. ideas come to me. And this one, you know, it, I, so it's 2016, 2020, so about four years, I guess, of slowly just accumulating songs that were more generic pop kid songs. Mm -hmm. But then because I was working so much in schools with kids, I really, and education background, I mm -hmm. really started focusing in on curriculum based music. Because funnily enough, when I would go into my schools and classes, I wouldn't sing my songs mm -hmm. because my songs weren't like jump up and down, spin around, right. tend to be a cat. <laughs> I never wrote like that. Yeah. So I was singing everybody else's songs. Mm -hmm. And then I was just like, okay, I want to write my own song mm -hmm. about these types of things. So I kind of had the generic pop kids music songs that were happening mm -hmm. at the same time as writing a bunch of curriculum based songs. So I thought, oh my goodness, I might end up having two albums come out at some point. I didn't know if they'd come out like together or yeah. or what. But then all of a sudden realize, okay, I have 10 songs that are the pop songs. Mm -hmm. It's time. How much <laughs> I, I, could, I could wait around to try to hit song number 11, 12, 13. But after four years, yeah, <laughs> like, I think we've waited. Yeah. <laughs> so this album does have 10 songs on it. Mm -hmm. And I have a producer in Brooklyn okay. that I work with. Um, his name is Marty Beller. And I met him about 10 years ago at an event. And so he produced my second CD, Lucky Day, and my third CR CD, RSVP, and then did five songs on this new album. Mm -hmm. And I was also working with Boston people, so I have my Boston producer, Bill Doucette, at Song Baby Sound. Mm -hmm. He did five songs, and then Marty did five songs. Okay. And, you know, between working with the mixing engineers and the mastering engineers, they just make it even though it's a whole bunch of different... You know, I had New York musicians, I had Boston yeah. musicians, but it's, like, seamlessly... The sound is seamless. Like, it doesn't sound like, oh, this sounds like the different studios. Yeah. It's very, <laughs> it's very um, smooth. Yeah, that's awesome. And the title is Make It Happen, which I know is one of your songs as well. Why choose that title for the whole album? That's a good question. It's <laughs> funny because a lot of the time when you're picking the title, you think about what the artwork is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And I have some other songs that would have been a much clearer, more tangible piece of song oh. called At the Parade, mm -hmm. which visually you could picture kids in a parade, you know? Yeah. So make it happen. It was kind of like, okay, that's the song. Um, not to say I love it the most, but it, it probably is the most inspirational. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. I hate to say I don't write that way, but like <laughs> I don't, my goal is never to be like, I'm going to write songs that are about peace or about kindness. Or, like mm -hmm. I kind of just write everything. I have a song called Goodie Bag. It's about getting a goodie bag at a yeah. birthday party. Mm -hmm. You know, so I write about so many different things, but Make It Happen is just really has came out one day, came out of my soul. And... It's a song that I feel like is meant to empower young. I think part of it, too, is being surrounded by young children mm -hmm. who are so loving yeah. and so kind and so happy mm -hmm. that, you know, they're, they're an inspiration and they, they are making the world a better place and learning, you know, learn all these things that they're learning at preschool and elementary school that are about treating other people well and... Yeah. And making change and, and doing all this stuff. That's kind of what Make It Happen is about. So mm -hmm. I was like, just kept coming back to that message. And it's meant to sort of serve as like a song that will empower young people. Yeah. Who, you know, it, you don't have to be, you know, someone with like, you know, a billionaire, let's just say, to, to sort of philanthropy to change the world. You can do it as a tiny, tiny little step on your, on your own street, in your own yeah. home, in your own school. So it's kind of meant to say you could do this on such a small scale or you could do this on this grand scale mm -hmm. as far as making your mark on the world. And then visually, I was kind of like, OK, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, um, because most of my audience can't read because they're <laughs> little. So I said, it can't just be the lettering. There has to be some visual to uh, to go along with it. And the opening line of the song is just about like the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, I want to try to visualize like rays of light and that that serves as your inspiration right every day you wake up it's a new day it's a new chance the sun is shining 
even if it's not. <laughs> even if it's flat, it's still there somewhere. Um, to just start over and do good in the world. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if you've seen, I'm like, I don't know if you guys have seen the cover yet or not. Um, I think that the artist did a great job of conveying what my feelings were. So I'm really happy with it. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think it's great that although it's not your specific goal to, I'm going to write exactly like this and I'm going to push this message, it is coming out naturally. I mean, even in your song boo boo which you know you even just say just you get back up you know and it's yes. there there's bigger messages that are kind of hidden in these songs where kids can understand but there there's definitely a bigger message happening and you know with what's it funny all. about you bringing that up is that I didn't even really I didn't sort of realize that and so mm-hmm. I had all these songs I had the 10 songs and it was like in in many of them there were there was this underlying message of that and I mm-hmm. think empowerment and, yeah. and strength and bravery. And mm-hmm. I, I didn't even, did not realize that it was not yeah. planned. <laughs> Maybe it would be a better sound bite if I, <laughs> I completely was not planned. It just, yeah. it just must've been something inside of me that I didn't even realize was happening. Yeah. And to kind of put it in all the songs in some subtle way. Yeah. Well, and make it happen seems like a very, you know, overarching mantra for you as well mm-hmm. over all these years, just working, you know, that snowball effect of I'm just going to make it happen. Uh, you know, what am I going to do about all these gigs? I'm going to learn the, the guitar. I'm going to make it happen. Right. So yeah. it all so it seems yeah. to support that as well. That is very true. Yeah, that's You're awesome. teaching me something. <laughs> <laughs> and I think as I'm, we're parents, uh, Frank and I both have daughters, so for being parents of daughters, what girls do, which is super empowering for girls, especially that, you know, you talk about basically how they can do anything, also breaking some ceilings along the way. And <laughs> so, yeah, that's awesome. I'm listening to it. Yeah. Yeah. That one. And I, like I said, I don't want to talk politics at all, but that yeah. one. So Elizabeth Warren is our Senator here mm-hmm. in Massachusetts. Yeah. And as she was running for president, one thing she would say to the little girl she met on the trail, she'd make them a pinky promise and mm-hmm. say running for president, it's what girls do. Yeah. And there was just, like I said, regardless if you like her or dislike her, mm-hmm. that message was something that really stuck with me. And I yeah. think, it, I think ha- as a young girl, if you're getting that message from somebody running for president, like how could that not just change oh, yeah. your life? You know, mm-hmm. so, and that's the first line of the song, running yeah. for president, it's what girls do. And then I wanted to really, you know, there's no right way and there's no wrong way. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, everybody you know, has it inside them what, what they feel is right for them, whether mm-hmm. it's going into a career or profession or not. Yeah. Um, whether it's going into the arts, business, education, you know, science, you know, the, the sky's mm-hmm. the limit. So it was really sort of meant to touch on a lot of different things that um, they could accomplish. And then also kind of like the line, yeah, there are no rules to follow, just some ceilings to break, you know. Yeah. There, there, there's just at this stage of the game and in, in the years that we're living in, mm-hmm. I just feel like, you know, there shouldn't be rules. I have two daughters and a son and mm-hmm. I don't, I didn't, I don't grow up telling them anything different of what they can be and what they can't be. You yeah. know, gender just doesn't have anything really to do with that in my, in my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, yeah. that song is specifically, specifically <laughs> about girls, but, sure. uh, but. <laughs> I never raised my kids thinking like, yeah, I, I don't think they ever felt like they were different than their brother and like, oh, their brother's going to be able to go do this, but I'm mm-hmm. not. like, I don't know. I just don't think. Yeah, I think it's definitely a completely different type of generation that's growing up now than and, and not that I feel like, oh, our parents were like, oh, well, boys do this and girls do this. But there was a general sense of that in the world of, agree, yeah. well, you're not going to be a construction worker. That's for boys, you know, or, or things like that. And at this point, it's like, you know, my kids will ask questions about certain things. And I'm like, no, that doesn't actually matter if you're a boy or a girl or, you know, you just, yeah. anyone can do that. And it, it's the message I think most kids are probably hearing yeah. <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Even if they're not getting the message, I feel like there's, there's going to be enough uh, exposure to information in the world that yeah. they'll get that message sooner than yeah. a, a lot like than our generation did for sure yeah. you know yeah. they just could mm-hmm. be exposed to more things and, and and more you know positive reinforcements definitely yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And I'd uh, love to make a video for that song. I'm trying to figure yeah. out. As COVID makes it a little hard to, to have videos with live yeah. children, and you know, <laughs> unfortunately. So, you know, I'd love, there's so many. So if anybody wants to fund a bunch of videos. <laughs> there that's you the other go. Thing that's really expensive, <laughs> making videos. And I'd love, I'd love to try to put a visual presentation of the music. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um, so I would love to do a video for what girls do. That'd be cool. Yeah. And you have great animated videos though, up on your YouTube channel. How did you get connected with someone to do the animation for them? Thanks. So <laughs> I did. So Soapy Bubbles, which is on there, is probably my most popular song, mm -hmm. um, which is 10 years old at this point, which is kind <laughs> of exciting. And on my new album, there's a little surprise because the last song is a Soapy Bubbles remake. Okay. Um, which is kind of a surprise. <laughs> and so I knew I wanted to do a video for that song. And mm -hmm. I had met this animation company, um, EG Design, at a conference. The same okay. conference that I met my producer. Met <laughs> at, it's a good conference. It's, it's a great <laughs> conference. It was called Kindy Fest back then. Okay. Now it's called Kindy Com. Okay. Um, and it was, it's like children's artists from all over the country would head to New York, head to Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and get together, network go yeah. to workshops. It was amazing. And and then they took it over in Philly. So we went to Philly for a couple of years. And obviously this year's was canceled because of, of COVID. But mm -hmm. um, so I had been in touch with him a long time ago. And then when I meant to figure out how to get Soapy Bubbles done, I contacted him. And um, like I said, animation is unbelievably expensive. So yeah. they, they do a good job of working with independent kids artists mm -hmm. um, to try to make it some some sort of reasonable yeah. and so then I did rocket ship with them also which okay. was I think my most popular video that has like 15,000 views which is kind of mm -hmm. nice and then we did beep beep which is kind of new which is a little bit more of a curriculum song right I just thought they did such a good job on that I just love yeah it. and then make it happen the one that I just released I just put it on YouTube today okay um is more of just a lyric video because I um I thought the w I wanted the words to be visually seen by yeah. my fans who and and people who don't even know who I am who's <laughs> not only fans but um, people to be able to read it yeah know, like my eight year old daughter I think that song kind of is not just like oh it's just for toddlers I think mm -hmm. it can go up to I would say seven eight years old and yeah. also the, that age can read so I wanted mm -hmm. them to visually see the words to the song so the lyric video I connected with somebody on the website Fiverr. Okay, yep. Which is a website for independent freelance artists that put mm -hmm. their work. And I found I found a lovely woman who I loved her work. And so we did, or I should say she did the main <laughs> animation. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and I know, you know, we've talked about COVID a little bit. And I know I had read that uh, at the parade, you kind of wrote early in quarantine because so many of the parades were being canceled. But kids were kind of having their own parades <laughs> at home. It's funny, that was like one of the borderline, okay, is this a curriculum song mm -hmm. or is this a general pop song? Because I really wrote it. Um, one thing about working with kids, they love they love to move and they yeah. love to pretend. And um, normally I get on the job training with that. So I could literally write a song in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I head into a school at 930 and I can test that song out yeah. immediately <laughs> and see, OK, this totally worked or like, oh, my gosh, this was a disaster. They didn't understand what I was saying. I was it was too fast, you know, whatever yeah. the tempo or how many, you know, words I squeezed into <laughs> a line. Um, and that one I couldn't kind of test out because I, I wasn't seeing any kids mm -hmm. um, until summertime. Then I did start to see some kids again. We did a lot of outdoor classes. but So I wrote that in March right after St. Patrick's Day Parade. You know, obviously New York City and Boston's mm -hmm. are such a big deal. So they got canceled. And, you know, that song, I have like the first verse is like people marching. Second verse is playing instruments. Third verse is clapping, and fourth verse is waving a flag. So I wanted mm -hmm. to do move like they could march, they could clap, they could play in the trombone, pretend, or guitar, yeah. whatever they want. So it really was meant to be a curriculum song, and I kind of had like this like Weezer '90s vision for it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, almost like that Weezer song, like "Island in the Sun." Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> that type of tempo. Yeah. And it was about a parade it was almost like I wanted like a subtle kind of yeah beat and everything 
And um, and then I just love the way it turned out. Yeah. That I was like, this is going on the album, mm-hmm. not just the curriculum. Yeah. No, that's so cool. So I know you do online classes. Was that something you were doing pre-COVID or is that brand new? No. (laughs) Definitely not. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's funny because there are some kids artists who are very successful, like YouTubers. Yeah. And they were way ahead of their game. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, everything shut down, obviously. And I mean, I had, n- I don't think I'd ever been on a Zoom call before March. Yeah. Right. I, mm-hmm. I taught my YouTube channel, like you said, I had a few animated videos, a few like videos for my songs, but I, mm-hmm. there were hardly any performance videos on there. I've never yeah. looked into the camera and sang before. I hardly did any, I mean, maybe a Facebook Live here and there, but not yeah. really. So it was a big change and I was really, you know, kind of mad about it, honestly, Mm -hmm. at first, just so like, you know, this is not, I mean, I'm, you're so used to just being with the kids and seeing them laugh and smile and jump and see them with their families and the parent child bonding that goes on. Yeah. That's what, I mean, that's the, the most amazing part of it is the Mm -hmm. interpersonal, you know, connection. And then all of a sudden that was gone to look into my camera and sing songs for YouTube, I was just like, I can't believe this. I don't know. It just was not anything I expected. But it's funny enough, it ended up being more fun than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And then the Zoom thing kind of started with some of the schools. And like Mm -hmm. I said, I learned how to do that because I had never been on a Zoom call at all. And then I realized, oh, my God, I can see them. (laughs) <laughs> see their faces and they're jumping and they're dancing yeah. and then it became fun like I could be like Jen great job and yeah Frank, you were awesome <laughs> so you could have that connection yeah so that made it better for sure and then uh-huh. once the um weather started to improve I started to get some inquiries are you doing outside classes and that's another thing talk about make it happen yeah <laughs> right <laughs> I, know, I didn't even think of it. I was like, yeah. oh, man, I am such a bad business person. <laughs> it, it didn't even cross my mind. Yeah. Because I've never done them. Mm-hmm. I've done outdoor gigs, but yeah. I've done an outdoor class. So I was like, okay. Yeah. And then I was slammed the whole yeah. <laughs> That's good. Which was yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, was wor- I worked like crazy because I knew it was all going to come to an end. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna be curious about is whether summer was a busy time or it's like, you know, I felt like you know it was like the wild west in the summer. You didn't know if everyone was inside or everyone was just trying to get it out. Right. So. It's really mm-hmm. true. It's yeah. so true. Yeah, everybody um wanted to be outside mm-hmm. and I you know would travel around to different people's yards, like neighborhoods would put classes together and I would you know, go to a a person's home, private mm-hmm. home. And then I didn't really want to do it in a public place, just just being a, you know, rad, like raving, mad disease spreading. I was like, <laughs> I don't want to just do this in an open park. Yeah, know? yeah. Um, but although some people did, which is great. That just wasn't my comfort level. Yeah. <laughs> so then I ended up doing, I have a fenced in backyard. Okay. So then I ended up doing it in my backyard. Okay. you know spacing everybody out. I could only fit about 10 families mm-hmm. um, but it worked out it worked out really yeah really that's well. great and yeah no it was super super busy yeah but I, and the funny but I didn't do one I think I did one gig like I did an outdoor library show okay normally my band is super busy yeah in the summer right and I, I had the last gig I had with my full band was yesterday january 11 2020 that was my last oh wow you didn't even know it right yeah wow oh my goodness yeah so do you think you'll keep the virtual classes going or even maybe some of the outdoor performances if (laughs) whenever we're at the light of the end of this tunnel (laughs) whenever we're there that's a good question i think um i definitely don't know if the demand will be as high for virtual Mm -hmm. back then more yeah. then as it is now. But I have to say, you know, I, I think I underestimated YouTube also. You know, people mm-hmm. do like it. And my daughter, yeah. I think it's funny because when my kids were younger, so I have a s- almost 16 year old and a 13 year old. Okay. Like YouTube wasn't as much of a thing when they mm-hmm. were little. Um, 
But now for my eight-year-old, I mean, they were the unboxed toy people. Mm -hmm. YouTube is like this booming thing. Yes. So, I mean, for me, I would want it to be to share new songs and music and curriculum. I would want it for parents, teachers, librarians, kids Mm -hmm. to watch. So I think I would still use it Yeah. to post songs for people Mm -hmm. to find and watch and learn new songs. Um. But I think that we'll see about the virtual classes. I think people might might be done. Yeah. They might be zoomed out. That's true. <laughs> but then you wonder, like, is this, you know, I keep I keep debating in my own head as if I'll come up with an answer of will this kind of have people looking towards Zoom classes or just virtual classes of any kind maybe over the summer or during school breaks as a way to keep kids engaged or just as a different way to learn? Or will we just kind of go back and to, to the past of, <laughs> of everything in person after that? Yeah. yeah. Know, it'll, the, the post-COVID world will be, will be very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think about camps and stuff like that where mm-hmm. you send your kid to camp and it's, it's a good amount of money, but could something go the other way of like, well, if I just had a couple hours on YouTube, yeah. <laughs> would right. I save money? Like, it's so there's so many scenarios, I feel like, that yeah. it, it could go many yeah, different no, directions. Yeah. Definitely, I think, will play a big role mm-hmm. also. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many, like, uh, what is that? out school I think where you can pay like five or ten dollars and do you know a yoga class or do a math class or whatever and it's like well if we do enough of those I mean it still doesn't seem that expensive if you were to do that it feels like the exercise industry I've been reading is like a similar you know wondering what the future of that will be yeah people are taking you know they're getting the pelotons at home and Mm -hmm. these classes at home yeah It'll be interesting to see what happens next. <laughs> Do you have a favorite performance or interaction you've had with a fan or just something that really stands out to you? And and maybe that goes back to your adult band days or, you know, something with kids more recently. Yeah, it's funny. I, I was thinking about that. Um, and it's funny when my so the first band that I was in, which was the Chicklets, mm-hmm. I think I my first gig was a July Fourth gig, mm-hmm. and I honestly I think the year was like 1992, mm-hmm. somewhere around that. I just so I graduated high school in 91. Okay, yeah. And I remember so I don't know if you guys are familiar with on the East End of Long Island there's a bar or there was a bar called Claudio's. Uh, it's not in Claudio's. Greenport. I don't know Claudio's. Oh, so it's this bar, oh okay. It's on mm-hmm. the water. It's in mm-hmm. Greenport. Mm-hmm. And. We got booked there on July 4th, you know, outdoor summer bar gig on the 4th of July. <laughs> and it was my first gig, you know, and I was on stage. We were on our little stage on the outdoor deck, and we had these American flags. Everybody yeah. got an American flag. Mm-hmm. We had them, and then every patron, I guess, when they walked in, got an American flag. Little tiny ones on the sticks, you know. Yeah. So I, it's so funny that I still just remember this. So. <laughs> I remember like we were doing our show and I just like raised the flag and like I raised the flag and danced and everybody in the crowd <laughs> put their hand up and raised the flag and like did what I did. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, they're like all <laughs> doing what I'm doing. I just thought that was like so, it's, it was such a funny moment, you know, yeah. I felt like I'm on stage, I'm singing, you know, having this like impact somehow and all these, and I just like lifted the flag up and like, to dance mm-hmm. around and like everybody did that and I was like yeah that was really cool <laughs> <laughs> you know? I know it sounds so silly and then I know one yeah. of my first high school um performances we had like a band like I said I was kind of in the in the band with the guys and my mm-hmm. first song ever that I performed was Buona Dead or Alive by Bon Jovi nice yeah and I only got that song because the guy who's supposed to sing it didn't want to do it he wanted to go to have a different part <laughs> in like the whole event and singing that honestly like changed my life in front of yeah. high school like the lights were out the spotlight was on I was kind of shy sang it and the place just went like ballistic yeah like, it was like crazy you know cool. and it was very cool and that yeah. that was really the moment I knew like okay this is what I want to this is what I want to do. Um, and I think with the kids' music, you know, there's so many just because you get so much love. Yeah. 
it's like every hug, you know, the kids just run up to you and hug you. And seeing the kids and the parents sing the words to your own songs, mm -hmm. I mean, that just never gets old, yeah. you know? And their kids' songs, too. And, you know, I remember we finished a show, and I, there was a song that I didn't do, because there's only so many songs you put in the set. And after yeah. the show, a mom came up to me with her, her child, and this was a band show also. And she's like, oh, my gosh, my... We love the song RSVP. Can you, mm -hmm. is there any way you could play that song? And, and I, I think we went, I was like, oh my gosh, like, sh yeah, you know, <laughs> it was over at that point. And yeah. I think we, we did it, you know, yeah. and, and the mom was just singing every word. Mm. You know, so when I when I'll ask the kids like, "Oh, do you guys have any requests?" and mm -hmm. I, I just never think they're gonna say my songs. Yeah, say my songs, <laughs> and I'm just like, "Wow, that's so cool!" <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's it's definitely a really good feeling. You know, yeah, to know that's people awesome. are listening. Yeah, and you're kind of feeling the same and reacting the same as you did during that first performance. Like, wait a second, yes. <laughs> wait, you, know, <laughs> you like me? You really yeah, like me. You Sally Field. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. That, that's a great thing when you're writing your own songs and the kids and the parents like it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. So since you're kicking 2021 off pretty big with a new album, do you have plans for the rest of 2021? Can anyone plan anymore? Are we not allowed to plan? <laughs> I, don't, I, know. I don't know. It's so funny because it's, it's very, you know, it's exciting when you're releasing a new album into the world and mm -hmm. trying to sort of promote it in the midst of, the pandemic yeah. in the midst of a lot of unrest mm -hmm. is definitely a little yeah. challenging. So I'm, I'm really happy that make it happen. The song can sort of be the anchor and, and start off making it this positive thing for kids mm -hmm. and families. Yeah. Um, so one thing that we're going to work on is we're in the middle of developing. We want to do like a hashtag make it happen campaign. Okay. For kids and families to engage in different ways so, you know, some of the core ideas in the song are mm -hmm. obviously make it happen, change the world, seize the day, spread love and peace. Those are kind of the four. That, those lines are actually even on the album cover. Um, so to, to pick pick those terms mm -hmm. and have like a call to action, what, what can we do? And I think, like I said earlier, a bigger theme for me is like it doesn't have to be this massive scale. You know, I just yeah. saw in the news today this one little girl – um, made rainbow loom bracelets mm -hmm. to raise money. I think it was on the Today Show. And I think she ended up raising like 30 grand. Or oh some my goodness. Crazy number just wow. by deciding to make some bracelets. And so, yeah. you know, so you can start off with this small idea. Yeah. And I'm hoping maybe it can be something that families can really enjoy focusing on mm -hmm. and, and, and not to say tune out everything else that's going on, but yeah. really focus on that can create some good. So that I'm really excited about. I'll keep you guys in the loop on when yeah. that all gets sort of rolled out. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully getting back to performing the new album live at some point. We're going to try to do a live, like us, a live online mm -hmm. separate screen yeah. <laughs> concert of, of some of the songs from the album, which will definitely be a new challenge that yeah. I have not done yet. I've all my <laughs> online virtual stuff has just been by myself. Mm-hmm. So that'll be interesting. But I see yeah. a lot of people who are doing it. Yeah. So we'll figure, see if we can figure that out. <laughs> um, and yeah, I still have, even though even though the album's coming, I have a lot of curriculum stuff that I still, mm -hmm. oh, and I have another project for ballet oh, that nice. I'm excited about. Um, my daughter's studio, they're amazing. And I, I kind of had the similar feeling as a music teacher, like, you're like, okay, I want a song. Let's let's take penguins, for example, mm -hmm. since they're behind me on my screen. <laughs> you know, okay, I want a song about penguins because I want my kids to do these moves and it's winter and I want to sing this information about penguins. And mm -hmm. I would look and I would look and I would search and I wouldn't find it. So yeah. then I would have to write it myself. Um, and that's kind of what happened with my daughter's ballet studio. So um, the owner came to me and was like, she felt a lot of the ballet music is date very dated. Mm-hmm. And she had specific moves that she wanted to teach her two and three and four year olds. And she could not find any songs about that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK, I know nothing about ballet. <laughs> so we had some meetings. Her name is Gina Fay from Dance Fit Studio in Natick. And we we met and she said, OK, this is the move. 
this is how you say it, this is how you spell it, this is what it is. Um, so the core moves that she gave me, I ended up writing this song called The Ballet Barn. Okay. So the ballet barn has a bunch of animals on it, and every animal is paired up with a specific move. Okay. So we have like Henry the horse, and Olivia the owl, mm -hmm. and Daphne the duck, you know, they all <laughs> have moves that they do. And it's like a six and a half minute song. Okay. So I would, I would write the song just on either guitar or piano and vocal, and I'd send her the demo. I'd say, okay, test this out. And then she would get back to me, okay, it's too slow, it's too fast. You know, we'd work out all the kinks. And then when it got to the point where it was perfect, then I would go with my Boston producer, and he would turn it into an actual, you know, mm -hmm. an actual musical piece. And then <laughs> I, would, I would sing... So the Ballet Barn has ended up being a really big hit with, with ballet studios. Which That's is awesome. Which is really a fun little surprise. So now my goal is to try to take every animal on the barn and have each have their own song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I have, and the other thing that we want, I really wanted to do was write a ballet position song about mm -hmm. the five ballet positions. Yeah. Um, so I just did that and it's, it's Breathe a Bumblebee song. Nice. And she's teaching everybody on the barn the five positions. <laughs> and so right now it's in the stage where Gina has it. She's playing it for the kids. And my mm -hmm. daughter's actually in her class now virtually. Oh, so nice. I got to see it. I got to, so she played the demo and I got to watch it with the kids doing it. Yeah. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, so now I'll get feedback from her. And I think it's close to turning over to the producer to actually make it into a musical that's piece. so, so I'm cool. I'm kind of excited for that. That's a really yeah. different project. That's another thing I never expected. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And then I think each animal that has their own song, then they should have their own books with the song lyrics, and then it can be a whole thing. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you want Olivia the Owl stuffies. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. That would be amazing. I would yeah. Love that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's awesome. That's really exciting. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, you know, just I don't know. There's the creative process is just so great. You know, mm -hmm. you just see where it takes you. Yeah, very cool. Well, do you want to leave us with your social media handles and where we can find your virtual classes and just where we can find you out in the world. Sure. <laughs> so I have a Facebook page, which is um, called the Stacy Peasley Band. And then I also have an Instagram, which is also Stacy Peasley Band. Okay. Um, let's see, what else? And I, those are probably the two that I use the most to communicate mm -hmm. with, with people. I also have a YouTube channel, Stacy Peasley Official YouTube Videos. Mm -hmm. And... My music class program is called Lucky Day Music Class, okay. and that's the one, um, that's sort of the class program, mm -hmm. but, you know, Stacy Peasley, all those Stacy Peasley handles will tie right into Lucky Day nice. Music, but I would love for you guys, you know, all your, all your listeners to find my videos. I have a bunch, like, at least right now I have about between 20 and 25 early childhood videos, so if you want classic educational, yeah. visually uh, <laughs> stimulating music and movement. You can just yes. pop on, pop the YouTube open, <laughs> play them one after another. You know? Love it. <laughs> yeah, I did have, I was listening to the album uh, and my four-year-old ran in and started dancing like crazy to goodie bag. So uh, I think that's probably her favorite so far. Um, but <laughs> I love hearing that. That's yeah. another nice part. I have to say, you know, there, there are, like Soapy Bubbles and Rocket Ship have definitely come out as like the absolute favorites. Yeah. But I get such a um, wide variety. Like I said, that one woman who, who wanted us to play RSVP, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that, that wasn't on my list of songs that are our favorites by any means. So I definitely yeah. get a lot of different songs that that kids connect with, which I like. And I yeah. love Goodie Bag. It's so funny because that song, I was just like, I mean, kids love, as a parent, right? Kids yeah. love goodie bags. They mm -hmm. are usually filled with just, can I mm -hmm. say the word crap on I know. <laughs> sure. sure. It's not my show, but sure, yeah. you can say it. I'm guilty of it. I mean, they just yeah. feel that 
bad thing. But oh, yeah. Bad candy and <laughs> uh-huh. terrible things. <laughs> but they love it. They're so excited for the goodie bag, you know. Yeah. And originally, it's funny because I had a list. So my, I had my daughter and my neighbor. I said, okay, give me a list. I'm going to write it down. What are your favorite things to get in a goodie bag? Mm-hmm. So I had this mm-hmm. whole list of items yeah. that I was going to put in the song. Then when I was working with the producer, he was like, I don't, I don't think you should put them in the song. Like the idea of the song is what's in the goodie bag. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really, and I kind of purposely made it like a nagging chorus. Yeah. <laughs> goodie bag, goodie bag. What's in the goodie bag? What's in the goodie bag? Mm-hmm. I want to know. You know, kind of like a kid, just like right. as we know yep. as parents, right? Constantly just like yeah. asking us the same thing. <laughs> And he was, and I was going to reveal what was in the goodie bag. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he said, "I don't think you should reveal what was in the goodie bag. I don't think, I don't think we should find out." What yeah. Was in the goodie bag. So I thought that was kind of funny. So yeah. it never, it never made it in. So now <laughs> we don't know what's in. The we'll goodie never yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what's in the goodie bag. I want to know. Big mystery. Yeah. <laughs> but it could That's be a good funny. conversation piece. You know? Yeah. yeah like, exactly. What would you like? to be in the good <laughs> it can be whatever you dance. like exactly but i'm so happy they like that song That's yeah awesome. dancing around to it yeah. <laughs> yeah. well thank you so much for coming on the magical mommy monday podcast i am so excited to listen to this album more definitely check out your youtube channel um with my kids because i'm sure they will get such a kick out of all the songs oh, thank you thank you for having me and honestly you know more importantly thank you for for finding children's music important yeah oh yeah absolutely because that really means you know it means a lot to uh, yeah to us artists who are who are doing this who are mo- for the most part in our own really little local yeah fields you know it's mm-hmm. hard to have a really big platform yeah um unless you're like disney or nickelodeon or something. yeah <laughs> so to, to have you guys spotlighting artists it's really appreciated no it's awesome i i'm loving learning more about different artists and hearing more kids music because you do tend to hear the same ones over and over so it's been so awesome especially to like getting to know your story and your background as well it's really cool thank you yeah so cool. i didn't realize we were all from long island I yeah. Know. <laughs> Even that much better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Magical Mommy Monday podcast. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Magical Mommy Monday, on Twitter at Magic Mom Monday, or you can email us at Magical Mommy Mondays at gmail.com. The music you heard on this episode was produced by Matt Harvey. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.